Hi. Uh, can uh, everybody hear me properly? Perfect. Thank you. Um, if for some reason during this talk I glance to the side, it's because I'm using a dual screen. So this is where my, my slides are. This is where all of you are. So uh, just letting you know. All right. Um, so this is a talk that will go over uh, some little bits of information that I found through time that I'm hoping that will be useful to you um, in the future. Uh, or maybe just things you might find, you know, huh, interesting. Um, which, yeah, I call it wait, but can do that. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, if any of you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them on the chat. Uh, if they're like quick to answer in the moment, I'll respond to it right in the moment. If not, we can try to, you know, reach out to me later on. Uh, I'm available via social media or here. Don't worry about it. Uh, so, who am I? My name is Rafael Fernandes. Uh, I'm Portuguese. Uh, born and raised in Portugal, but then I moved to the Netherlands almost five years ago when I got offered the job here. Um, and yeah, I have been, I've stayed here ever since. Um, that's my Twitter handle and GitHub. Uh, so if you have any questions later on or something, you can reach me via Twitter, for example. Um, the slides of this talk are available on my GitHub. So feel free to, you know, later on, download it, read it. This is just a single HTML file, so you can run it anywhere, even on your phone. Uh, so use this as um, you know material to consult as much as you want. All right, so this talk will be divided into four different proper uh, parts, CSS, JavaScript, HTML, and browser DevTools. Um, each particular thing that I'll be talking about will have, as you can see here, the first one, a little reference to how adopted it is in all the browsers, just so you know, you know, what are we working with? Although almost everything that I have here is actually um, widely adopted overall. I think if this, this one, the ad support is actually the least adopted of them all. Um, so starting with ad support, basically you can use CSS to ask the browser if the browser supports a particular CSS property so like this, you can see if the browser supports display flex, and then you can use display flex if it does. If it doesn't, you can use a different way of achieving your results, or maybe, you know, structuring things differently. Um, and there's a little bit of flexibility you can use with this. You can also get see if the browser does not support, um, or you know, just different types of things that you can check, or even. You can concatenate and see if my browser supports this particular tag and this particular tag, then I can use uh, it properly. And it can be useful in like particular use cases where you want to support all the browsers. I worked in a project in the bank for some time, and uh, I had to support you know IE11, unfortunately. So sometimes these things can come out a bit useful. The cool thing about it is that you can also use JavaScript for this, so even though this is a CSS thing, you can actually use JavaScript to check if it's possible via two ways, via this property and value that uh, you can see, or uh, checking the entire rule set, see if it's available, um, which can be cool for things like, I've had cases with animations a long time ago that you'd have to use JavaScript for it. So if the browser didn't support, for example, animations, then you can use JavaScript to like hack your things away around it. Uh, but yeah, just, a good uh, tidbit of knowledge for you. Now, this one, the nth functions, this is actually very useful. I'm assuming a lot of you have had to use, you know, the typical, you know, document query selector, blah, blah, blah thing. Um, well, this is basically me playing with that. Um, this is just a very simple thing. I'm going to show you here. So there's a main uh, and there's divs. That's basically what I'm doing here, right? So using the nth selector, you can use, you know, uh, nth uh, child to select, the, you know, child number five. So something like this, this would be the CSS that you use. But the cool thing is that this actually allows you to give in uh, linear functions. So, you know, a linear function, uh, for those who don't remember, because I normally wouldn't, is like, you know, something time, times n and being your variable plus whatever number. So here, if I want to select multiples of three, I can do something like this, three n. 
and you go through all the, the different elements. Now, on top of that, and this actually, I have this example because it was useful for me in a project that I worked on where I wanted to um, highlight the five elements of a particular list. You can use select instead of nth child, use nth last child, and use then the function, uh, the linear function, to select them. So how would you do that? Well, like this. Because now you're counting the last child, so you're going you know, towards the end. So you have to do minus n to keep counting after the, the end to, towards after that, and give it a buffer of five. And then now you have the, five, the last five elements. A lot of people that I can remember would use JavaScript to select this, as in like select all the list elements, reorder, or, or slice the array, or whatever. This is a lot easier uh, and cleaner as well, more efficient, because just using CSS. Um, and then on top of this, you can select even and odd. Those are accepted keywords. A lot of people do know this. And so granted, this will normally work with an audience uh, in real, you know, real audience. So um, a little challenge for all of you to think is then how would you select all the even elements that are also multiples of three? Well, it's actually quite simple because you can concatenate these selectors. So if you do that, you can do, for example, this um, the same select that we had here, the nth shell 3m, and then out of all of those, select only the ones that are even. Uh, so you have actually a lot of flexibility with these selectors um, to you know, do CSS things to certain elements. Uh, you have actually no need to use JavaScript for all these things, and uh, it is very, very, very flexible and efficient as well. Now, moving on, um, the atter. That means with this, and this, this is uh, something you can use to get content of a particular attribute of an element. Uh, so for example, here, my div has this little data content, the custom property uh, with just a little bit of text. And then by adding just you know div before, adding, giving the before, the before display block and giving it content by getting the atter, the attributes getter, you will get something that looks like this. So this is my the content of my div, and this is the little thing that comes before, uh, which can be useful when you give some, give some some things like a particular highlight, with uh, you know a content or a data attribute that can change or something like that. It can be really really useful. Now focus within. This, if you work with a lot of forms, can be extremely useful. Focus within allows you to know if a parent element has a child element that has been focused. So let's say, for example, I have a form, and my form has an input and a parent that has multiple inputs. Now, when you select your input with the, with the focus um, uh, selector, you give it a border to give it you know, a little bit of a highlighted state. You can do the same with the parent. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, here, you see, when you click here, the entire parent becomes visible. This can be really useful in situations like this where you have a, you know, a billing address and a shipping address in this little mock website I made to highlight, to like kind of guide the user in what it's doing. This can be also useful for people that have limited visibility, that don't see that well, where for accessibility purposes, you can add something if you have the, the browsing accessibility mode or something like that. It is uh, very powerful and just, yeah, a single CSS rule. Now, font display. Um, I can imagine that a lot of you have worked with custom fonts that either you load from you know, a different uh, domain or from your, from your own domain. Um, and with this, you have a way to work with it. See, a lot of, in, in the before times, so to speak, um, browsers would not render any text if set text was supposed to have a particular font and that font was not loaded yet. With font display, you can tell the browser, render this text in you know, uh, the system font, for example, and then when the font actually loads, show me it. Um, because yeah, they, by default, it actually I thought it quite strange. I think only one browser, which was Safari, would actually load in system font and then really show the proper font once, once it is loaded. So by using uh, font display block, you can tell the browser, OK, I'm expecting this to change in the future. So you give the browser almost no time of not rendering any texts. 
And then once the, um, the font comes, then it switches. And these are just different times. Basically with the swap, you're giving a little bit of time of not rendering and then rendering the texts. Um, and then when the, the, the font arrives, then you do a switch. And optional, you're basically, basically saying like, if the font does not arrive in a particular small amount of time, then don't swap at all. And this can be very useful because let's say, for example, you're getting your font from another domain that for some reason is slow, that you know it's behind, behind your uh, control. Um, you can use this to show your texts. Uh, let's say, for example, you have a, a blog with a lot of text. Like it, it doesn't really make sense to not render it, to not give any information to your users. So um, you can use this for your advantage. Uh, regarding my GitHub URL, I'll give it to you in the end of the talk, okay? I'll repeat it, I'll write it right on the, 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 the thing. No problem. Uh, custom properties. Uh, using custom properties is basically CSS variables. A lot, of, a lot of you might not even be aware of it. At least I found that some developers think this is like, you know, only available in SAS or something like that. No, this is part of CSS standards already. Um, and it means that, especially for people that are developing, you know, styling libraries for an organization, you can then have, you know, your typical colors, your, your spacings, your, your, your grid spacers and all those things. And one file that is exported, it can be used by other people. Uh, so this is how you would use it in just pure CSS, no SAS, no nothing. And it becomes, yeah, really simple. Um, now the really cool thing is, and I'll show you the reason why I'm adding this to the root element here. You can change it using JavaScript, which means that in real time, by clicking a button or whatever, you can change particular types of, of the, the styling of your page uh, and make it look like, you know, really reactive or whatever. And I have a little example for you on that. So using just these two things that I showed you, the JavaScript and the CSS, by changing the color or the spacing, I can do something like this. Really simple. And even, I don't know if you can see it very well, but I can also change the color as well. And this, if you're using something that is, you know, you want to make it customizable for, for your user or whatever, that means you can have a set of variables that everybody is using. And then your, your client or your user changes those variables and then everything trickles down and changes in the entire document. Not by changing variables, just by changing the value of those variables. It is extremely powerful in customization and gives you a lot of flexibility. Now moving on with the rotate. Now, most people know how to use Rotate in CSS. Uh, and this is actually more interesting because of the, the um, variables you can use with Rotate. See, I worked in a project, but I had to do some, some animations and I use Rotate for that. So I was using to, I used to use just degrees, which is what most people use, but you can also use gradients. Gradients are basically dividing a circle into 400 different parts. You can use radians, uh, you know, that little um, pi related uh, variable. But the coolest thing that I found out, and honestly, it took me almost the, like 10 months, I think, to figure this out is you can use turns. So one turn is the equivalent of 360 degrees. 0 0.5 turns turn, you know, 180. It can be a lot easier to read and understand your code if you're using turns. Once I did actually, you know, stop using weird math or trying to remember, you know, what is a quarter of a rotation or, a, or whatever and start using turns and it just kind of makes a lot more sense. Uh, yeah, for, for readability, it's a little thing that has been available since rotation has been created for CSS. And for some reason, most people don't know it. So I hope you do use it in the future. Now, display flow routes. Flow route is useful. Uh, for a particular thing, basically for clearing the um, the, the fix hack, uh, the um, sorry, the clear both hack that I used to call it. So let's say you have an element, a container, as a child. Set child is supposed to be on the bottom and floating towards the right. Because of this float, it stops being part of the um, the flow of the parent element, which means then to add that you know the, the child to the element to the parent focus to the parent scope on the, the flow 
you have to add this weird hack here, which always felt felt weird. Now you can just use this flow roots. Uh, you're basically telling your the parent elements to keep um, the children elements part of its um, scope, even when they're floating. So a very simple example of that, the same uh, page I was showing you before, using those exact same uh, CSS properties, uh, without the hack, of course, you go from this to this, which looks a lot nicer and a lot more readable as well when you have to like understand why the parent has that weird hack of the, uh, and then you remember, oh yeah, it's the, the flow thing that because of the float and yeah, that's not a thing anymore. You can now use this, which makes it a lot easier. Object fit cover. This uh, is useful because when you're using images or even videos, this works with both images and videos. A lot of people to have that flexibility of like, how would my background image, whatever work would put that on the CSS. This you can just use with image and video elements and have it work like those backgrounds alignment things uh, that you have on CSS as well. So instead of using, you know, the background repeat or whatever, or background fill, you just use object fit. And automatically you have something uh, that, that does this. There's, all, there's more, the same options that you have for the background you will have here, which gives you, again, a lot of flexibility. Uh, and also, you know, an image looks a lot better. <laughs> um, you will see this face uh, a little further ahead. This is one of my, my heroes, Jake Archibald, the developer advocate at Google. Really cool guy. Now, this is actually an inter interesting thing. This is kind of an intersection between CSS and JavaScript in a way. You can tell an element to not have any pointer events by using a CSS property. So if you don't want anything to be clickable at all or any other thing to, to pointer events, just add it to none. And if you want something to be clickable, you can just put it back to auto. So I'll give you an example of that here. So you have this little weird page that I created. I cannot click here. I cannot click here. And there's no even no hover state whatsoever. Only because I added the CSS property to do that. Now here, as you can see, the hover state already exists. And also here, it's clickable. So you can do these things. And I, for example, I can give you a, a very practical example of this. I was, I'm working in a, in a project in which I wanted for a parent element that has little checkbox inside to when you click the parent, you know, click the, use the, use the for the checkbox. So what I did was I made the checkbox not clickable and I made the parent clickable and the parent deal, dealt with the state of the child. That way you can never click on the child. You always click on the parent and you have things a lot more streamlined for, in my case, state management of my particular page. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, extremely useful as well. Will change transform. Well, granted, this actually is will change transform is just a property. You use this to tell the browser that a particular animation property will change. So what, what happens here is, um, especially for animations, it used to be the case when you did a particular um, animation, the browser would render the entire, entire single frame that you would see. By using will change transform, what you're doing is, and the browser uses like, the, basically the browser developers learned from game developers, from game engine developers to do this. They basically make two separate layers and they animate one layer on top of the other um, for, you know, to, to gain a lot of efficiency because especially if you have something coming in, um, you don't want to animate the entire page just because of, you know, something pops in on the side like I had on the other page. So in this example, I have also here because you don't have to always use this only on transform for animations. You can use also use for opacity, which is the example I have here. Uh, and so for the page that I showed you a while ago, when you click here, basically what the browser is doing is he is animating this in on a separate layer because I have which will change transform here. And it's also animating the opacity on this on a separate layer. So it's just doing these two things separately and not combined. Um, granted, there's one caveat for this. If you use a lot of will change transform and you're like putting a, a lot of layers on top of each other, that is a cost. 
So, you know, try not to put too many in, in one go. But yeah, it can be very useful. This, I think a lot of people will know, uh, or I have touched upon this because of Display Flex. Justify content allows you to um, space out uh, and align things horizontally. So the three examples I have here, space between, maximize space between elements, space around, make sure, make sure that the margins between each element are exactly the same, or space evenly, that the, the space between each element and the surroundings is always the same. And this just does amazing things for aligning things horizontally. If you're getting into Display Flex, I would highly advise you to go into, um, I think it's CSS Wizard, Wizard websites, where you have like a, a sheet sheet on how to use Display Flex that has this and a lot more. The variable fonts. Now, I talked about fonts a while ago. Um, and this is something relatively new. Um, fonts usually have some variables in which they can change, like the um, boldness, uh, so on and so forth. With variable fonts, you can add more variables to this axis and make fonts change in a custom way. So I'm giving you an example of that here. So this is a font that was created and has these two particular, th this particular thing that, you know, called swarm, that, that makes this little animation. And this is just a font, like the same as, you know, changing height or, or boldness. Um, and this can have a lot of potential, if, especially if you work with like digital agencies with marketing campaigns, you can do really cool things with this. It's, I think only two or three years old, so it's not crazy recent, but also not crazy normal yet. So maybe if you wanna explore, feel free. It is quite cool. Now I'm going for HTML. This is something that a lot of people don't know about. The Realm Opener is something you can add to links to make sure that the website you're opening cannot connect to your website. And I'll give you a very, a very useful, like, simple example of that. So let's say you're on a website that opens another one with a link, an anchor element like this, very normal, right? So you would normally use this on one.com is your website and opens two.com with that. Now, because you didn't add no opener, two.com in its context can have the reference to the page that it opened by using window.opener. Um, and if you have the window object, that means you also have access to a lot of things like location, which allows them to then use uh, changing the location of that website, which could be used in, a, in, in a, used in a malicious manner. That, you know, it changed to some malicious website that looks like yours, but isn't actually like yours. And this could be yeah, tricky. Uh, if you use rel, rel no opener, that means that that window.opener does not exist. And so, boom, that connection is not available anymore. So you are a bit more, a bit more siloed in your little you know, container. Uh, but there's one thing on top of that is quite useful. See, when you open a new page with, without Realm opener, the same process, the same thread is going to do that page, which means on the, the background page, the other one, things get slower because they're sharing resources. So here, you have a demo of that. I'll take your time for a sip of water. As you see there, performance is a problem. If you use rel no opener, what will happen is that the browser will spawn a new process for the new tab and not hog resources for your for the other one. So I guess this, I guess for the developer that ha doesn't have to have the issues with security uh, in, in the front of their mind is also something that could be interesting to you. Now, going on even further ahead, you can use rel preconnect. And preconnect is basically a way for you to eagerly connect to a particular domain. Uh, and why would that be useful? Well, connecting to domains and, and, and establishing like you know the initial connection is always the browser intelligently always uses separate threads for that, never the UI threads. So let's say, for example, that I have you know a little example here, um, and I have a page. And this page wants to use a font from Google, right? Pretty common. So I have, you know, my font face, the saying that I want to get fonts from, from this page. Okay, cool. So this would be what happened, right? You see here the browser is getting the HTML content, is loading it, parsing it, and rendering it. And then when like the basic stuff is done, then it connects, connects to the, 
Google website or a Google domain to download the font, and then when the font is downloaded, it renders it, right? With this, you just add this. So basically, you are telling the browser, like, OK, let me connect preemptively, eagerly to this domain. And then it goes from this to this. So what is the difference? The difference here, then, is the moment the website uh, can, it will eagerly connect to this. And then we'll have the asset that is the font available quicker and then have it available to render it later on, uh, which makes, makes things a bit quicker. If you want to, let's say your website uses a few fonts uh, or you want to eagerly get, um, sorry, eagerly connect to a particular domain where you know in the future you will be downloading it, downloading stuff, then, well, you can just make the connection beforehand. Now, if you want to do a step even ahead, you use rel preload. And preload, instead of eagerly connecting, you are eagerly loading an element. So let's say in the exact same page, uh, I add um, a div with a hero image. So, you know, when the, the browser loads, you know, you have your CSS, your JavaScript, that happens normally. And then when everything is said and done, then the browser looks and says, OK, I have an image here, has a source, got to load it. So it has to connect to a particular domain that has that image, downloads it, and then renders it, right? With using preload by doing very similar to pre-connect like this, you're loading this asset eagerly to make it available within your browser. And then it will go from this to this. So as you can see here, before things are rendered, you will see the browser doing the eager load of the assets. And then later on, when everything is, is properly, the asset is already there. So there's no fetching time. And remember, all of this stuff, when we're talking about connecting or, or even downloading these things, the browser will use a separate thread for it, which means you're not hogging the main UI thread, which means that you're making things faster. But uh, at the same time, you're giving yourself more time for things. Uh, so it's a really good and quick uh, like performance boost you can have. Now, going forth for JavaScript, this is a little negative information that I got really randomly. Window.length will give you the number of iframes in your page. I used to work in a project with a lot of iframes. <laughs> I hope you never do. But yeah, just a weird thing that I found out by accident. Document design mode. This is something I used to like pull pranks with some colleagues of mine. Uh, when you switch doc document design mode on, you basically make every little text node um, editable. So I'll show you an example here. This is a regular text node, right? If I click here, everything that is a text node can be changed. And the same here, even inside these buttons because they have the text mode um, things here, right? On top of that, if you do content editable on a particular element, it's the same as the document design mode, but only for a single element. So in this case, just this one, but this one, it is not possible. Yeah, uh, can can be fun to make people freak out about things. <laughs> um, document collection. This is a way to get to things in your uh, uh, HTML collection. So if you do document on all, you get all the elements, the images, all the ING elements, all the anchor elements, all the style elements, all the scripts, all the forms. Now, the forms is the interesting part because if you use forms with proper IDs, something like this, to access that particular form, instead of using like document query selector, you know, a hashtag ID, document.forms.login form. And if your login form has elements also with IDs, because IDs are unique within the document, then document.form.loginform.elements, because you're going through all the elements, and those elements, because they have IDs, are accessible like that. So you can actually make things a lot more readable than sometimes using weird selectors and situations that you might need. And you can bypass things just by using proper IDs and, and proper HTML structure. Exact command. This is very useful if you're doing like events websites or like you know, why is he wig editors? So doing like this, copies things to the clipboard, cuts, paste, undo, redo. So this is this can be useful for like a niche kind of thing. Uh, and it's quite powerful as well, as you can see. Um, ooh, bind once. This is a good one. 
Um, I would imagine that a lot of you have added, you know, event listener to something that is supposed to run only once. Uh, an example of that will be the onload event that's supposed to happen only once. And then you have to remove that event listener, right? Um, if you use this, so compared to before, what you're basically doing is you're telling your browser that this function is supposed to run only once and that it is automatically garbage collected without you having to use the remove event listener API. So it makes things a lot cleaner for you. And this can be very useful because of one thing, because if you forget to um, remove things, so let's say you're you know loading data or on something, when the when the when the, the element is the, sorry the HTML content is loaded, this data, you know, is in the scope of the callback function, so it's never never garbage collected, until the function is completely removed. So then, if you do that, automatically you're cleaning up things that otherwise would never be cleaned up ever. So you know, freeing up memory, it's quite useful. Foreground detection. This is uh, like you use this more if like you know not necessarily a YouTube developer like you're running videos and you want to like stop videos running when the customer is not using um, those things. So you can check using visibility change if you are on the foreground or not by checking documents hidden. And if so, you can do things like yeah, video pause and video play. Um, just, you know, you can play around with, you know, your customer is having focus on your website or not, if you want to do something. An example of that would be, yeah, you're pulling the server to get data, let's say in real time or whatever. And if the people, if the, the, your user is not using the website, then why should you be, you know, keep pulling server for information? It's just useless work that you're doing. You can just do that later on when the user comes back to your website. Uh, the intersection observer is something I really, really like. Basically, use this to learn or to detect the moment in which a particular element is going to enter the view. So this can be very useful to know when, yeah, when elements enter the viewport. So let's say, for example, I have a website which has a lot of images, but I don't want to load all of the images in one go because a lot of images are like, you know, a thousand pixels under or more. Then what you can do is by using the intersection observer API, which is like this, you pass it a particular function um, and you have, let's say, you know, images that have all the class lazy because these are these lazy loaded images and all these images have uh, the data, the source attribute on um, a data attribute, but not on the source. So when these become visible, which you can do by doing this, well, then you can just change the um, copy the source from the data set attributes to the actual source and then the image will load. Um, and then you can also, you know, like I said before, to clean up uh, resources, stop observing that image once that image is loaded. The cool thing is that you can also give um, here an object, uh, you can check on that on the documentation uh, to give yourself a buffer. So for example, if my element is like, a hundred pixels away from entering the the view the viewport, you can preload that image so then the user doesn't have to see everything being loaded. You can do that kind of eagerly as the user is scrolling for your content, uh, which uh, you really really improve you know perceived performance a lot by using things like this. Orientation is you now the devices are you know phones are used everywhere. You can use this to know how your device is oriented to do things like, you know, when you turn the device down, stop playing a video, when you do something, turn on something. Um, so you have these three different um, variables, the alpha, beta, and gamma. And you can, um, yeah, use things to know, like I said, if, yeah, what look at what thing the device is. This particular variable is just a placeholder for something like this. Uh, when beta is 180, that means the device is down. Uh, and you can yeah, do your things. And you can also, using uh, Chrome DevTools, simulate this to, do, to test this locally on your browser when you're developing. Very, very useful. WebShare API is, I think, the last JavaScript thing. Uh, this is basically if you want to use the native device share 
so let's say you click on a button and then you're using the, the share API to, yeah, share a particular blog or a text or, uh, you know, something. Then because of this, it would actually open your brow your device's native share API as iPhone or Android or desktop, doesn't really matter. Um, and then you just, you know, you give that like real native experience and also you give the user what the user is used to. So we're just they're really improving user experience there. Now for the end, we're almost done, DevTools. Ways you can use to take screenshots of things. This can be very useful if you're like showing your designers how things look like. So you can capture screenshots of the page as it is, right? But you can also capture the screenshot of your page full sized. So it means you're getting everything that is there, even that is not visible, which you can use, for example, in coordination with that thing I was telling you all about, the intersection observer, to know if you could, you know, game the see if things are there or not. Or you can do a screenshot of a particular element, just like this, uh, which you can use to like, you know, hyper analyze something. Uh, so this is, yeah, very useful when you want to control things uh, to a fine degree. Oh yeah, and the performance monitor. This is something I, I don't want to bore you too much with it, but basically on your Chrome, in your performance tab, if you uh, enable the advanced um, instrumentation, you can see useful things like how much CPU is being used. Uh, and I was talking, uh, you know, like a while ago regarding uh, garbage collecting things. What is the size of your heap? Uh, you can turn on, turn things on and off, so you can see like what is there, what actually isn't there. There's a lot of control that Chrome DevTool has that you might not know and is super, super useful uh, to know. Even like even on this particular example that I'm showing here, I am triggering garbage collection manually. It is really, really powerful. And uh, well, this is the end of the talk. I'm also, I think I'm a little bit over time, I'm not sure. Uh, and I hope you liked it. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, you know, reach out to me. Also, either you are right, uh, breaking pointer events is usually not a good idea. It's for, um, you really have to think about what you're doing there. Uh, so you, in this particular situation, you'd have to have something that is ARIA friendly uh, to work with. But yeah, I hope you all uh, liked it. And uh, yeah, I'll be available for any questions. Uh, this is being recorded as far as I've been told. Uh, Drupal Jam will uh, give this in YouTube format. Uh, so you'll be able to see this later on in the future, I think. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ida. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, any questions? Oh, yeah, the GitHub. I will sh give that to you. Give me just a second. Uh, I'll share you the link of my, my profile, actually. Let me just open it here, and I'll copy-paste it for you. So these are this the, um, the link to this particular presentation is right over here, and you can find my GitHub profile through there. No problem. And, you know, Go through it, learn, experiment. Tell me about things you might might have learned if you if you want to, but um, experiment as much as you want. I, I, everything that I'm doing and every talk that I do, I always like put it on GitHub for everybody to experiment. Even if you want the demos that I'm making, uh, I will also give it to you. Um, I have a little server with all the demos that I've done, um, where you can run everything locally. You know those little like the the the, the fake shop and all those things, uh, you can run that as well by using this one that I'm copying right now here. And yeah, fork it, do whatever you want. It's MIT, so it's pretty much yours almost. <clears throat> All right. Um, well. If uh, there's no, no, no further questions, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn off my camera. Uh, but I will still be online here. So, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions or any details you might want to know, okay? All right. Hope you guys have fun with the rest of the conference. Bye. <laughs>